It's an amazing thing when Jesus steps into our lives. We so value his presence as we worship. It's so wonderful to have the Pavlovskis with us today. And before we dismiss, we're going to come. The hour's late, but the message will be brief. But we're going to come to the word of the Lord, to Scripture, and to the end of a three-part series we've simply entitled, When Jesus Steps In. It's built on the three resurrection appearances that Jesus has uh, as recorded in the fourth book of the New Testament, the Gospel of John. And two weeks ago, we saw how Jesus stepped into fear. Last week, we saw how Jesus stepped into doubt. And to conclude our time, there's one more resurrection appearance in John. And we're going to stay, see that Jesus stepped into failure. He's going to step into your failures and in mine. Now, when I was a kid, I grew up with, a, with the comic character Dennis the Menace, right? They called him a menace for good reason. So in this one particular cartoon, um, they had a picture of Dennis. He sang his evening prayers, and he's kneeling beside his bed. He's got his pajamas on, as well as his cowboy hat and his cowboy boots and his holster. And his hands are folded, and he's looking up towards heaven. And the caption in the bottom says, I'm turning myself in. <laughs> and I'm sure we've all had that feeling. Like, we just need to, I'm here to turn myself in. Because whether it's failure, some of us have really messed up some relationships, to be honest, in our lives. Some of us have really messed up some job opportunities. And, you know, we blamed other people, but really we made some bad decisions. Or we were the ones that were too lazy uh, or had bad attitudes. Some of us have really messed up in parenting. And some of us have made some real mistakes. I mean, we've just really drifted spiritually. There's been spiritual failure. Our hearts were on fire for Jesus at one time. And now we're kind of lukewarm, if that. And, and, and then there's moral failures. We've made some moral decisions that have deeply hurt the people we love. And, you know, we, we live by the lie that we could, you know, I, I, I can play around with this and that, and, and I, I'm, I'm on top of it, I can handle it. But, but now you're addicted. And, and it just doesn't seem to break. I mean, failure is in every area of our lives. There's not a one of us that, that is immune from having to turn ourselves in. Just like Dennis the Menace, I'm here to turn myself in. I pray today that we'll just turn ourselves in wherever failure has been. We'll not live in denial. And, and Jesus is going to go right to failure in Peter's life on the night before he's crucified. They're at the Last Supper, supper table. All of a sudden, Jesus looks at Peter, who he also called Simon. And he says in Luke 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. In other words, there is a demonic power. Satan himself wants to totally dismantle you and crush you. He wants to shatter your life. That's Satan's agenda for you, but it's not my agenda. And so Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, so that your faith will not fail. You're about to fail me in a very bad way. But I have prayed that being shattered by failure will not be the last statement on your life. But I've prayed that somehow you are going to come out the other side of this with faith. And when you have turned back to me, then strengthen your brothers and make a difference. So here's God's purpose for us. So sure enough, sure enough, just a few hours later, Jesus is arrested. First of all, he's taken to the high priest's house, and there was an inner area where Jesus was being questioned and abused and mistreated. And Peter was in the courtyard area outside around a fire, and people start recognizing him. And of all things, three times, Peter, talk about failing spiritually, Peter completely disowns Jesus. I mean, at one point, the scriptures tell us he curses and said, I have never met that man in my life. And then this stunning moment where somehow their gaze is collected, connected. Have you ever had somebody look you in the eye and like they could see right through you? And, and here it is, verse 61 of that same chapter. The Lord turned in that moment and looked 
straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord has spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter went outside. When our failures finally collapse in on us, Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. This was probably the lowest moment of his life. He just disowned Jesus and all of a sudden Jesus just turned and caught him by the eye. And he remembered what Jesus had predicted and how he had failed in spite of the warnings. And this is it. This is failure. There's no, there's no getting around it. There's nobody to blame. You're just crushed by failure. He went out and he wept bitterly. And so Jesus does die on the cross. He rises again three days later. And uh, according to John, there's already been two resurrection appearances. And the third one comes at a time when some of the disciples had gone back up from Jerusalem up north to the Sea of Galilee. And originally, originally Peter was a fisherman. So he said to some of his friends, he said, I'm going to go fishing. And this is in verse 3 of John 21 now. He said, I'm going to go out to fish. But Peter, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. And then something that's going to be a flashback for Peter begins to happen. He went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. They fished all night and caught nothing. And, uh, and, then, and then they're coming back towards the shore, and they see somebody standing on the shore. They don't recognize him. This is Jesus in, his resur- in another resurrection appearance to them. And Jesus yells out, did you catch anything? As if he didn't know the answer. And Peter yells back, no, we've fished all night. We didn't catch anything. And surely he's starting to relive a deja vu moment in his life. And Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you're going to find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And why would this happen on this particular resurrection appearance of Jesus? It's because Jesus was doing something with Peter in helping him to work through his failures. I believe he starts with, with every one of us. Let let Jesus, if you failed in your family, if you failed in your relationships, if you failed morally, if you failed spiritually, let's, let's find this starting place. Let Jesus take you back to when you first encountered him. That first time that you encountered him. Because um, this ought to take Peter back to when Jesus first called Peter. This would have been a couple of years earlier. Look at how that happened in Luke chapter 5. When he, Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let your net down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And of course, Peter was just a fisherman and Jesus was talking his language. And Peter falls on his knees and said, my Lord, I'm not worthy of you around. And Jesus calls Peter to follow him. Now, now this is over two years later. And, and Jesus, by repeating that miracle again, that same guy, I didn't mean to catch anything. Throw your net in again. All of a sudden, they're overwhelmed with fish. Jesus was reconnecting with Peter at the point where he had first connected with Peter and called him. And I think God calls us back to that place in our lives always. When he's beginning to rebuild out of failure in our lives, he wants to take you back Take you back to when you first met him and your heart was on fire for the Lord. And remember that sense that you had value and you were loved by God and, and that he had a purpose for your life and he had a calling in your life. And, and I want to tell you God's purpose and calling is still in place in your life no matter how you failed him. His purpose and calling is still in, on your life. I have a $20 bill here. You probably know what I'm going to do with it. I mean, this is worth 20 bucks, right? I could spit on it. Is it still worth 20 bucks, even though I've demeaned it? No. And insulted it? No. Now I'll crumple it up. Wouldn't want to exactly give this to a teller or a store clerk. I'm crumpling it up. And now I'm going to step on it. 
I'm going to step on it and squish it and stomp it. My question is, what's it worth? Stepped on, spit on, and stomped, and all crumpled up. What's it worth? 20 bucks. And it's like Paul, God, Jesus coming back to Peter, and he's saying, you failed me, but I prayed for you that your faith is going to survive even your failure. And I'm going to bring you back to when I first called you and when I first encountered you. And I'm going to say it again to you. I have a purpose and a destiny on your life. And I prayed that that will not end up being shattered with everything that else has been shattered in your life through your failure. And then the second step is to let Jesus guide you through the steps that undo your failure. I'll fix my $20 bill later. Let Jesus guide you through the steps that will undo your failure. So Jesus is on the shore. They bring all these fish in. He's in his resurrected appearance. It turns out he has a fire going, and he's been cooking breakfast. They put some of their fish on there. They're eating breakfast. And verse 15 of John 21, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? What an embarrassing question. He just denied Jesus three times within probably just two or three weeks earlier. And, and Jesus looks at Peter and he said, John, do you love, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these, more than these other disciples who didn't deny me? Oh, what a question. It's painful when the Lord starts undoing our failures with new steps. And he starts often, and it's not always easy. It's painful. But he's going to kind of reaffirm some things. And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. That would be his church, his people. Okay, Simon's got that over with. That was awkward. Uh-uh, Jesus didn't stop it. How many times did Jesus, did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. So, for every one time G Peter disowned Jesus, Jesus is going to reclaim Peter. But it's going to be a process. It's also going to be a three-step process. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And the answer, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And sometimes, sometimes as Jesus undoes our failure, as sometimes Jesus takes us through the step of rebuilding, it's painful. You got to face up to your failure in fresh ways. Jesus is trying to say, you still have value to me. We can be like when we first met, when I first called you. Again, it can be reclaimed. But there's some steps we've got to walk through. And it sometimes is painful. It's going to take courage to rebuild your life if it's shattered right now. But Jesus is going to walk you through this. So the third time he asked him, and, and Peter's hurting now. And, and, and Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said one more time, feed my sheep. Now restoration, as Jesus walks us through the steps that undo failure, restoration will usually always involve repentance. And sometimes it will involve restitution. Because there are things that need to be rebuilt after failure in our lives and in our character. And first of all, they need to be made right with God. That's what repentance is all about. This is repentance. This is coming back to God and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, and, and I grieve, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start following your way. I always thought I could do a better job at being God than you. But, oh, God, I repent. I'm trying to run my own life and, and all the messes I got myself into. And I come back. you got to get right with him. And sometimes repentance means a lot of painful honesty. 
And, and sometimes it even involves confessing to one another. The Bible says confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Sometimes it's even confession to others for the sake of healing and the sake of freedom. When you confess your sin and repent to God, you're forgiven. But sometimes even there are processes where we, we need to confess to one another for, for healing and to freedom, to bring these hidden things in our lives and broken things into the light. And, and these things are, are amazing. I remember a number of years ago, somebody going through a 12-step program, and, and he came and he just wanted, he said, I, 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 just, I, I just feel like for freedom, Pastor, if you just let me, if you would just sit there and just let, and he had a list written out, if you just let me walk through all the failures of my life, all the places I've blown, all the places I've sinned against God, I just want to not only confess it to God, but I want to confess it to you and have you pray for me. And, and it was a touching, it's touching whenever somebody does that. And it's very humbling. And he went through his whole list. And then I prayed for him. And then I grabbed his, his list. And right in front of him, I just tore it up with joy into little pieces and saying it's gone. Because God can free you from the past. And sometimes it does take repentance. Sometimes it does take even confessing our sin and bringing it to the light to one another and praying in Jesus' name. And sometimes it even involves restitution where you, you do need to go and have the hard conversation. You know what I, what I did to you was terrible and would you find it in your heart to forgive me? And, and, and to your boss, you know, I, I embezzled some funds from this company and, and I don't know why I did it, but I'm gonna do all I can to pay you back. I mean, this is restitution and it is not easy, but I wanna tell you, Jesus has your freedom in mind. Jesus has the restoration of your call in mind at the other end of this kind of suffering. And, and as, as you may know, some scholars debate about how important this is, but there's two words in Greek for love. There's kind of a stronger word, that familiar word agape, that Jesus, this is God's love for us. And when the first two times that, Peter, that Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He uses the word, that, that, that stronger love that we associate with God, that stronger word for love. There's a little bit weaker word for love, and often it, uh, these two words overlap. It's more the word you might say when you say, I like pizza or I like my friend. It's the word we get Philadelphia, brotherly love from. Jesus says, do you love me? He uses the stronger Greek word for love. Peter responds with the weaker word. Yes, Lord, you know I like you. <laughs> That's all he could bring himself to say. Jesus, second time, do you love me? He uses the stronger word. Peter responds, you know, with the weaker word for love. And the third time, Jesus uses the weaker word. And he meets him where he is and says, do you Philadelphia me, so to speak. And Peter says, now really hurting in his heart and watching Jesus bend over backwards to reach him right where he is and start this rebuilding process. Three questions for three denials. And Peter said, you know, and he used the weaker word again. But he became the first man to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the living church. And I want to tell you, Jesus wants to take you back to encounter him where you two started, where you and Jesus first started. And if you've never met Jesus, he, he wants to have that encounter with you right now. You're living with a myth if you, think, if you think that you can be better at being God than God is. And if your heart's rebellious against it, I want to tell you there's a starting point. And if you have walked with him, but your life just feels shattered. Right now, you just feel like my life's in pieces. I just, I can't even pray without being overwhelmed with all the ways I've blown it. And I want to tell you that Jesus wants to say, you're not a $20 bill. You're, you're of invaluable importance to me. And I still have purpose on your life. And let's just go back to the beginning. Let's start from start again. And then let's let me walk you through the steps that can rebuild you from failure. The Japanese have an art form. It's called kintsugi. Uh, kintsugi. kintsugi. I've been trying to practice how to pronounce that name. And it's an art form. It's because sometimes, like, like these bowls, 
these ceramic bowls will be used in tea ceremonies and other things, become very valuable. They're often handed down as heirlooms. They, they would sometimes become shattered. They'd be dropped or something would break them. And so they'd put them together again. But when they put them together again, after they put them together, this is more than a super glue operation because there's chips that can never be restored. But what they do is then fill in the cracks with gold and silver until, until there's just a beauty. And then they relaminate them and, 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 and they glisten and, and you, you see this bowl recovered you, you can just look it up on the internet. You, you can see gorgeous pictures of these bowls with, with these lines of gold and silver all the way through them. Everywhere there was a crack. And they say that those things, they sell for even more than the original bowl sale for. That, I mean, we're not talking 20 bucks. We're talking 30 bucks now. Whence it's been repaired. I want to tell you, Jesus can repair your life. And you can be stronger than before you even went into a failure. Jesus said, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And God answered that prayer, thank God. And God wants to answer that prayer in your life. Will you stand with me, please? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Will you thank him right now that he's here in this place and he loves us and his restoring work is available to every one of us. Thank you, Jesus like the worship team to come and we praise you Lord we praise you Lord while our heads are bowed eyes closed yeah. you know this is for all of us whether we serve Jesus or not you can you just want to wave your hand at me and say Pastor Jim I, sometimes I feel like my life is just a mess right now I don't know how I just I'm crumpled and I just I just so disappointed in myself and and just, I just feel like I'm shattered and I don't even know where to start. And, and, and you, you just wave your hand at me and say, I'm, I'm going to trust Jesus to start a rebuilding. If, if he's willing to meet me where I am, I'm going to trust him to start a rebuilding in my life. You just wave your hand at me. I'd love to pray for you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You see, you see our lives right where they are. We thank you. There's nothing too hard for you. And then I want to ask if there's those of you who are here that don't, don't know Jesus right now. You, you've not walked with Jesus. Or maybe it's been a very long time. And, and you've been far from God. But this is your day to come back to the one who can rebuild us. You, you, you'll say in so many words, I'm doing a terrible time of being the God of my own life. And, and I need to come back to my creator and my redeemer. If he died for my sin. If he can wash me clean and forgive me. If he can rebuild the broken places in my life. I'm going to give my life to him today. You'll wave your hand at me so I can pray for you as well. So I'll look over this wonderful congregation this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'd like to invite the prayer partners to come, if you would. Let's sing a closing song just before we dismiss. And you come. If you're starting a relationship with Jesus, if you need healing in your life in any way, or there's just something else you want prayer for this morning, prayer partners are here. They'll be happy to pray with you. Amen. Let's just lift our voices to the Lord. Hallelujah. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed yet not forsaken
Thank you, Lord, for the way you do that. You lift the broken to life. Thank you. That, Lord, no matter what failure we've been through, Lord, our faith need not fail. There's a hope that you're going to restore your call on our lives. You're going to restore that relationship with you. You're going to rebuild the places till we're stronger, more beautiful, more valuable than ever before. And we thank you for that. Bless us as we go today and those who linger to pray longer. We pray that as we go, we will go in the grace of our Lord Jesus. And we'll go in the love of God. Thank you for your amazing love. And we'll go in your presence, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Remember, we only have one service next week at 10 o'clock. But a great Mother's Day celebration in our lobby for every woman in the church at 9. God bless you as you go today. And you're welcome to continue to come and linger for prayer if you like. Thank you.